We all have how do I questions. How do I tie a tie? How do I survive a shark attack? How do I make French toast? How do I lose weight? But some questions are more meaningful than others. How do I deal with difficult people? How do I overcome fear? How do I handle stress? How do I hear God's voice? So where do we turn? To the one who has all the answers. We'll tackle some of our biggest questions and discover God's best plan. Why? Because we all want to know, how do I? We're in part two of this series called, How Do I? So we've got all these, these big issues. We've got these big questions in our lives that we need answers to. And so what we're doing is we're going to the Bible. We're going to the Holy Scriptures, God's Word, to see what God has to say about these big issues that we face in our life with our family, with our own selves, with, with work, with school. And we want to know, what does, God say? what does God say about these things? Last week, we asked the big question, how do I hear God's voice? And we said that we hear God speak to us when we read his word. We hear God speak to us when we cultivate his presence through prayer and worship. And we hear God speak to us when we get planted in a church, which means not just showing up, not just attending, but it means we're involved in Christian community when we're doing life with other brothers and sisters in Christ because so much of what God has to do in our lives comes through relationship. And so this question, of the how do I hear God's voice question, is so foundational because we need to hear God speak so that we can get all the other questions in our life answered, right? So today's question, the big how do I question that we're going to address today is how do I deal with difficult people? How do I deal with difficult people? You know, this is a question that we all have all throughout our lives. It's not just at one point in my life. I just wanted to know, how do I deal with difficult people? Now I've got it figured out, and I don't have any problems with that anymore. No, we deal with this question all throughout our lives. We come across difficult people all the time because there's no anxiety like people anxiety, right? Life can be going along so well, and then boom, all of a sudden, you get that phone call from a family member, and this, now you're in a difficult situation. Maybe you're at work and you're navigating through some things with some difficult people. Maybe you're at school and someone at school's got it out for you. But the good news is this, that God has some solutions for us. He has some good things to say to us about how to deal with difficult people. Now, several of us, we got to go to the beach this summer right? You got to enjoy the sun and the sand and the water. How many of you, if you got to go to the beach this summer, let me see your hand. Raise it up high. Brag. Boast, everybody. Yeah, I didn't. So thank you for rubbing it in my face. Lord, help me not deal with bitterness in my heart because I did not get to go to the beach this summer. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't get to go, but I'm not bitter about it. Um, but, you know, those of us that have been to the, the beaches, public beaches especially, you see those, those towers, those lifeguard stations, right? And they're, they're manned with lifeguards. And what the lifeguards do is they know that uh, there, there's uh, particular conditions coming. You know, strong currents, riptides, waves, uh, undertows. What they, they'll often do, you might see this from time to time, is they'll take an anchor and they'll take it out into a particular area that's a trouble spot. And they'll drop that anchor and it's attached to a buoy which floats there on top of the water. And they do this so that it gives them a focal point. It helps them with their bearings so that when they have to get out into the water, into various conditions that, are just, that, are, that may be unknown, at least they know where they are, they know the areas to avoid. It's a focal point. Well, in life, we can experience strong currents. We can experience undertoes. We can experience riptides as it's concerning relationships. And... The issues that we face sometimes in our relationships, sometimes there are unknown factors. Sometimes things do seem unstable. And so we need a focal point to help us navigate the different relationships in our lives in different seasons, maybe as your kids are growing older. You know, I've got a 15, almost 16-year-old now, and it's not the same. I don't parent her the same way or deal with her the same way as I did when she was three years old. Seasons in our marriage change. You might find yourself in a season in your marriage that's like, wow, we've never been here before. Things at work can get tense. Things at school can... So we've got all these things, 
All these different relationships, and we need that focal point. And I can't think of any other focal point that's any better than God's love. God's love is my focal point when I'm dealing with difficult people. There's nothing like discovering God's love for you. And when you truly have a revelation, when you start to get revelation of God's love for you, it changes your life, and it changes everything about your life, and it changes even the way that you deal with other people. One of the greatest ways you'll discover God's love for you is through relationships, like I just mentioned. That's why you need to be in a city group. City groups are a place where, where we've provided this environment where you can receive love, and then after you've received love, you don't hang on to it, but you're able to also give love. And you need God's love to be your anchor, to be your marker, to be your focal point. Because not only are our relationships the place where there's, like, you experience life's greatest pleasure, relationships can also be the place where you experience life's greatest pain. You know, one of the main reasons why, you know, relationships can be difficult is because of just people are different. People are different than me, and that is a problem, right? You know, when Jamie and I first got married 19 years ago, we were so in love. We're still, in, we're still so in love. We're, we're more in love now than we have ever been before, but when we first got married, we were so in love, but then I quickly realized how different we were. She is different than me, and this is difficult, right? I mean, when we're in the car, she likes it 95 degrees. <laughs> I like it 33 degrees, one degree just above freezing, you know? Thank God for dual air climate control in vehicles, right? She likes creamy peanut butter. I like extra, extra, super deluxe, extreme, crunchy peanut butter, yeah. right? Amen. Come on. Where are my real peanut butter people? Yeah. Just go ahead and throw some unshelled peanuts in there, in that jar, because that's, that's the way God made it. <laughs> Jamie, when she grabs the toothpaste, she squeezes the toothpaste from the middle of the tube like an insane person would. <laughs> I squeezed it from the bottom, again, as God intended for us to do so. She likes thin crust pizza. That's like, like, that's like just throwing some marinara and cheese on top of cardboard. I want my crust on my pizza to be like Olive Garden breadsticks. That's what they need to do, is they need to make a pizza that's just the crust is Olive Garden breadsticks. Right? So there's all these differences. And different sometimes is difficult, right? God didn't create us the exact same. As a matter of fact, you know, in one of our DNA modules, we take time to learn about our differences, you know? Because, like, why is difference so difficult? Because I'm perfect, right? I'm perfect, and my way is the only way, and it's the best way. So we learn about these different personality types, and the, the cool thing about it is, is that when you learn how God designs you, it helps you learn and figure out your destiny that he made you for. And so that's why we take time in, our, in our, one of our DNA modules to say, all right, how did God craft you? We're going to take this personality assessment. And the, there's all kinds of wonderful tools out there to assess your personality. But the one that we use here at Seeds Church is called True Colors. And it breaks all the personalities down into basically four, four of these major colors. And it's gold, green, orange, and blue. Now, we don't have time to go into all of that today, but I did bring you a different kind of personality assessment today that can just you know, further explain and illustrate the differences that we have and why that can be difficult. This is the superhero personality assessment. We can also say the supervillain personality assessment. And we all have these people in our lives, and, some, and we can identify some of these people sometimes, okay? So the first one is Batman. Batman. We all have a Batman yeah. in our lives. He's like, uh, I'm Batman. You know, and, <laughs> and you know, there, there are just a person, a few words. You're like, hey, man, how you doing? I'm Batman. <laughs> okay, you've said that already. I get that. I just, I'm just trying to get to know you. Who, who are you? I'm Batman. Oh, are you okay? Something's wrong with your voice? I'm Batman. <laughs> tell your friends about me. I, I don't know what to tell them. Because all you keep saying is that I'm Batman. It's like they have a mask, and they can be sometimes, 
introverted, and they're mysterious, and it's hard to get to know sometimes. And, and the next person we all have in our life is, is the joker, you know? It's like somebody's like, <laughs> all the time. They just want everything to be fun and games all the time. And that's good sometimes, but sometimes it's like, hey, can we get serious for a minute? And they're like, <laughs> would you calm down? That's just crazy. Would you stop that, please? Then, then we've got Two-Face. You know, uh, some people, are, they're, they're just unpredictable. They're, they're two, it's almost like they're two different people. They have high highs and then low lows. And sometimes you just don't know which person is going to show up today. Is it going to be Rebecca or is it going to be Becky? <laughs> Mr. Freeze. We've all got a Mr. Freeze in our life. This is the guy that knows how to bring the temperature in the room down quickly. Like nobody knows how to make it awkward like Mr. Freeze. Like, dude, why did you bring that up, man? Like, what? Did that, why did you say that? That's, ah. Uh. And then how, like, throwing it, uh, we kind of swung to the supervillain. Let's go to the, the superhero, back, swing the pendulum back that way. What about Wonder Woman? I mean, she's the best at everything. It's like 5 o'clock in the morning. Her hair and makeup is perfect. She's like, good morning, everybody. I made this for you. And you're like, what is that? It's soap. <laughs> what? You were making soap at 5 o'clock in the morning? What? Her Pinterest board looks like she could give Joanna Gaines a run for her money. Her Instagram profile is perfect, you know? And, uh, you know, it's like, what did you do this week? Well, I finished my PhD in nuclear engineering. <laughs> and I ran a marathon while pushing a stroller. She's the best. Then you got Superman. Superman is Mr. Perfect. He's good looking, but he's a one-upper. You have these people in your life, they're always one-upping you. Like, man, I had a good day. Mine was better. <laughs> We've got all these people in our lives. Sometimes these people live at our house, like the Hulk. Anybody have a Hulk that lives at your house? No, don't, but no, 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 don't be pointing. <laughs> Don't be pointed out. Listen. You know, you got these like outbursts of anger and just like overreactions sometimes. It's like, honey, can you pick up a gallon of milk on the way home? What? I thought I picked up milk two days ago. Are you turning green? And then, of course, you know, Dr. Strange. We don't have to say a lot about Dr. Strange. You know who you are. We've got all these different kinds of people in our lives, right? There, there are people that we work with. There's people that we go to school with. There are people in our own family, people in our social circles, people here at church, people in our neighborhoods. And there's tons of different people, and sometimes different is difficult. But oftentimes, the difficulty that we have with people isn't just about personality differences, it goes deeper than that. There's, there's a spiritual battle at war. See, without relationships, life has no meaning whatsoever. I mean, if you were the only one on this planet, some of you think to yourself, some of you introverts, you know, you're like, that would just be wonderful. But I promise you, after a period of time, uh, it, it just, your life would seem meaningless. And so the quality of your life is directly impacted by the quality of your relationships. And because relationships are the place where God's love is most expressed to you, Satan wants to do everything he can to mess you up in the relationship department. Paul, the Apostle Paul said some things about this to the church in Ephesus. And in, in, in Ephesians, he, he said, we don't war. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. It's not just about personality differences. There is a spiritual battle going on. There is something that's deeper that, that goes beyond what we can see with our physical eyes. The Bible has a lot of wonderful things to say about how to deal with difficult people. A lot of great things. And like we said last week, the Bible is not, it's, it's not a history book. It's not just a history book. The Bible is not a self-help book. It's not just full of good principles that, well, if I just apply these principles, I'll live my best life. It's not just that. It is the living, active Word of God. And when we read it, God speaks to us. 
So I want to take a look at a few passages here for God to speak to us about how to deal with difficult people. And we're going to see some strategy that God is going to give us on this issue. The first piece of strategy comes from when Paul was writing to one of his protégés, Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, this is what Paul wrote. He says, again I say, meaning, hey, I've told you this once already. I'm telling you again because this is an important issue. You need to listen. You need to do what I'm telling you to do. Again I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. That sounds about like half of my social media feed right there. (laughs) A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but they must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and everybody say this with me, and be patient with difficult people. Be patient with difficult people. What is Paul saying here? I think if you boil it down, what Paul is saying, hey, if you don't have to, just don't get involved. Just stay away from the mess. Just don't get involved if you don't have to. Don't go there. There are so many situations in our lives that we just kind of walk right into on our own choice, and we walk into a difficult situation with somebody else. And it was completely avoidable. Don't leave that passive-aggressive comment on Facebook. Don't send that snarky text. Don't you know, just, just stop wasting your time and your emotional energy on arguing about things that make no difference in the scope of eternity. Don't get sucked into the debate. Just stay away from it altogether. If you do this, if you make all these avoidances, you're going to avoid all kinds of nonsense. And I promise, it'll make your life a little bit lighter. There'll be a little bit more pep in your step. You'll find yourself smiling a little bit more. Just don't get involved. It's a good strategy. I know what some of you are thinking right now. But JD, I can't avoid difficult people 100% of the time. It's absolutely true. You can't. I understand that. But there's a lot of things that we can avoid. But there are a lot of other things that are unavoidable. So what do we do about that? I mean, unless you live in a cave somewhere by yourself, you're going to experience difficult people from time to time in your life, right? But God still wants us to be patient with those kinds of folks. And if we yield to the Holy Spirit's uh, wisdom, if we yield to his voice, if we lean into the power that he makes available to us, we can be, what Paul said, we can be patient with difficult people, people that are hard, people that are harsh, people that are annoying. I think it's funny sometimes, though, how we just think it's the other person that's being hard. It's, it's just the other person that's being harsh. It's just the other person that's being annoying, but sometimes... We can be difficult as well, which leads me to this next one here, this next strategy that James, the half-brother of Jesus, he writes about this in James chapter 4, and he says this in verse 1, where do you think all these appalling wars and quarrels come from? Do you think they just happen? Think again. They come about because you want your own way, and you fight for it deep inside yourselves. You lust for what you don't have, and you're willing to kill to get it. You want what isn't yours, and you will risk violence to get your hands on it. You wouldn't think of just asking God for it, would you? And why not? Because you know you'd be asking for what you have no right to. You're spoiled children, each wanting your own way. Wow, so uh, let's just pray and be dismissed right there. (laughs) Man, James just lays it all out there for us, doesn't he? He just says it like it is. You're being spoiled children. So what strategy do we see here? What strategy is James giving to us here about how to deal with difficult people? He's saying this. He says, get out of the me, myself, and I mentality. Get out of the me, myself, and I mentality. Sometimes it's, just, it's not just the other person that's being especially difficult. Sometimes it's me too. You know, living your life with the me, myself, and I mentality... It never, it never ends up serving myself, really, even though I think it does. It really doesn't serve me the best, and it doesn't, of course, doesn't serve anyone else the best. 
If all you're ever worried about is me, myself, and I, then eventually all you'll ever end up with to do life with is you, yourself, and no one else. And life is meaningless without relationships. So we've got to get out of that rut. We've got to get out of that mentality. Let's walk away from the me, myself, and I mentality. And like so much of the other scriptures that we see here in the New Testament from what Paul said, he's like, let's think about others. This topic, seriously, this how to deal with difficult people, this one topic could be an entire series. But I want to give you one more strategy here today about dealing with difficult people. And this comes from the Apostle Paul. He's delivering some truth to the church in Galatia. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Now, Paul, again, he's laying it all out there for them. He's telling it like it is, and this is what he's saying. He's saying, hey, if you take your life and you just root your life in just whatever it is that you feel like doing, then the automatic fruit, as your life is cultivated, as your life matures, the automatic fruit from your life being rooted in whatever it is that you want to do will look like this. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery. I mean, these are some heavy hitters right here. Those are some big things. That's some serious stuff. But you know what? Paul doesn't stop there. Paul keeps going, and this is what he says. He keeps adding to the list. Hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, Envy. You know, we, we tend to kind of downplay these last eight things, and we really play up those first five things. I mean, come on, sexual immorality and, and uh, you know, idolatry, sorcery, lustful pleasures, impurity. Those are some serious things. But Paul's saying, hey, it's not just those things are serious. These, are things, these things are all serious in your life. These are all important things here that you need to be looking out for. And he, and he continues, he says, drunkenness and wild parties and other sins like these. You mean drunkenness and wild parties and orgies? Are the, he's, he's throwing that into the same bucket with jealousy and with outbursts of anger? That's what Paul's saying. He said, this is the fruit that your life will produce if you just root it in whatever it is that you want to do. He says, let me tell you again, this is important. As I have before that anyone that lives that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, thank God that God just doesn't leave us stranded out there on sinful nature island. Amen? He has a plan for our lives. Thank you, God. That God's plan for our life includes redemption and restoration and renewal. Thank you, God. Because Paul, Paul doesn't end his, his thought right there. He goes on to say this. He says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Now, I know many of you are probably very familiar with this passage of Scripture because it's commonly known as the fruit of the Spirit, right? And so the, this is a list of things that we're about to read here. This is not a list of things that you have to, to strive or work to obtain to obtain this level. I'm going oh, to work. I'm going to try. I'm going to if that were the case, if this were a list of things that we're about to read here, if this list were things that we had to strive and work to obtain, we wouldn't be practicing Christianity. That's not the gospel. That's called nirvana, and we would be practicing Buddhism. But this is what Paul is saying here. Again, your life is a tree. You get to decide what kind of fruit that your life will bear? What kind of fruit will your life produce? It's not about trying or not trying. It's not about do these things and don't do these things. It's about which soil are you going to plant your life into? Are you going to plant the tree of your life into the soil of sinful nature or are you going to plant your life, your, the tree of your life into the soil of Holy Spirit nature? And whichever soil you choose will automatically determine the kind of fruit that your life will produce. The, whole, the, the fruit of the Spirit list that we see here, this is not like, well, i got to just try to love more. i got to just try to, uh, joy! <laughs> as far as I know, I've never, like, oh, peace! Come on, peace! It doesn't come that way. What Paul is saying here 
is this is just the natural overflow. This is what your life is going to look like when you spend time with the Holy Spirit. He's giving you, this is, a, this is a buoy. This is a focal point. This is when you hang out with the Holy Spirit, when you make your life his home, when you spend time in his presence, when you hear, when you listen for him to speak, when he speaks his truth of your life, when you begin to believe it, when you begin to act on it, he heals your wounds. And the relationship that automatically comes out of that kind that. The fruit that's produced automatically out of that kind of relationship, it looks like this. It looks like love and joy, peace, patience and kindness, goodness, faithfulness and gentleness, and self-control. So the third strategy that we see here as we're dealing with difficult people is we've got to allow Holy Spirit to come and develop well-formed fruit In my life. It's really not so much about the other person as it is is about what God is doing in my life. I can't control the other. I can't control the people. I can try. I can try to manipulate. I can try to control. But that doesn't that doesn't do anything. That doesn't do anything fruitful. Thank God again, he doesn't leave us to our own devices. Thank God that he has a vision for my life. And I just say, God, I want love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, and self-control. That's what I want my life to look like, God. So God, cultivate my life in you. Cultivate my life in this church. Help me bear this kind of fruit. Amen? Amen? Amen. Now notice this. Notice that these are the fruit of the Spirit and they're not the gifts of the Spirit. Paul said, he says, we should desire all the gifts. All of us, we should desire the gifts. And here's here's how this works. Holy Spirit might give Logan one kind of gift, but he might give me a different kind of gift. But this list of things that we just read, this is fruit of the Spirit. This is not a gifts list. So you can't just say, well... God didn't give me the gift of patience. God didn't give me the gift of faithfulness or kindness. That's just not me. No, I'm sorry. That's not how this works. We're not talking about a gift. We're talking about fruit. This is something that we're all, all of us are called for our lives to look like this. What does it mean to be a Christian? It means that you're a disciple of Jesus. What do disciples do? Disciples follow their master. They learn the way of their master. They don't want to just know about their master. They don't just want to have information about their master, but they want to be exactly like their master. This list here that Paul writes out, the the fruit of the Spirit, do you know who this describes? Describes the person of Jesus, our master, the one of whom we are disciples to, the one of whom we want to be just like. If we choose to hang out with the Holy Spirit, this will be the automatic fruit of our lives, and we will automatically, our lives will automatically begin to look like Jesus. And this is a primary key to dealing with difficult people. Holy Spirit, come and develop your well-formed fruit in my life. And what you'll find out is that when you encounter difficult people, like Jesus did, you'll be able to handle those situations. You'll be able to deal with them the right way. Yeah, some situations are avoidable. Yes, that's true. But God knows that not every situation is unavoidable. Not 100%. There are going to be things that happen. Jesus dealt with difficult people all the time. Some of those people were considered his enemies. And some of those people, those difficult people, would probably be considered closest to him. Sometimes it's unavoidable. You just can't avoid difficult people all the time. Sometimes God brings them into our lives. God brings them into our lives sometimes to mature us. And sometimes God brings them into our lives 
for us to help them be mature. You, you want to talk about someone who had a lot of difficult situations to deal with over and over and over and over again for 20, 25 years? Read Genesis chapters 37 through 50. Talks about a guy named Joseph. Joseph was thrown into a pit and into a prison of bitterness. But he didn't let it affect him. Listen, some of you need to hear this right now. You may have bitterness coming at you. There might be bitterness all around you. But bitterness does not have to be in you. You need to know God sees you. He knows what's going on. And he wants to develop his well-formed fruit in your life. He wants you to get out of the me, myself, and the I mentality. And when possible, he just wants you to don't get involved. But let's do this. Let's lean in to what Holy Spirit is doing and developing well-formed fruit in our lives. Let's hang out with Holy Spirit. Let's make our lives his home. When he speaks to us, let's not ignore it. Let's not chalk it up to coincidence. Let's, just, let's pay attention. Let's lean in. Let's invite him to speak to us. And when he speaks, let's act on what he says. Let's believe what he says. Let's do what he says. Can I just tell you a story real quickly? It's something that happened yesterday. So I've got a 15-year-old who's learning to drive. She didn't have a permit yet. And so at our house, we've got these parking spots across the street from our house. And the, both of our vehicles were over in those parking spots because um, we were doing some yard work. And I was going to move the cars back into the driveway. And so uh, my 15-year-old runs out and says, hey, Dad, can I help move the cars? I said, absolutely. I said, hop in the front seat here. I'll get in the, in the passenger seat, and I'll just, just do what I say. And so um, what Jelana didn't know was that there was a median behind us as we were backing out of this spot. And there was a big boulder in that median. And we were headed right for it. We have a backup cam. I can see it. And I say, stop, put the brake on, put the brake on, put the brake on. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of elevating each time I say it, and she finally does. She's like, what? Why were you, why were you like raising your voice at me? It's because you weren't listening to what I had to say. Well, she goes, well, I didn't know why you wanted me to put the brake on. I said, well, that doesn't make any difference. You have to just do what I say. You don't have to understand. Listen, you don't have to understand everything Holy Spirit is telling you to do. Just do it because He has your best interest at heart. He's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to help you. He's trying to avoid your life hitting a boulder. Just do it. Just be obedient. Why don't you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I just thank you. Again, you've got good words for us today. God, I think you've got great strategy for us. God, again, we receive any affirmation that you give to us. We receive correction. We receive direction. And we make this declaration, God, that we just want to be obedient to you even if we don't understand. Help us, God. God, I know there's some serious situations going on in, in the lives of some of us here today. God, there's some, some wounds. There's some hurt. And maybe it has to deal with family members. Maybe it has to deal with, with people at work or at school. But we invite you to come in, into our lives, into these situations. Speak to us. Heal our hearts. Give us insight. Give us wisdom. Give us strength. Give us strategy on how to deal with difficult people. And help over, over all that, God, help us develop well-formed fruit, your well-formed fruit in our lives. Help us. We invite you. You might be here today and you feel far from God. I want to tell you, you don't have to feel that way. 
God is close. He's closer than you think. There's a scripture also in the book of James, also in chapter 4, that says when we draw close to God, He draws close to us. So if you feel far from God today, you can make the decision, I want to come close to Him. Here's the gospel. We talked about what the gospel is not. Here's what the gospel is. You were born into this world a total mess, a total train wreck, whether you knew it or not. You were born into this world with a sinful nature. And God saw this. He saw this about humanity. And he had a plan. And it was to send his son, Jesus, to the earth. To be born of a virgin. Why? Because if he was born of a virgin, he wasn't the seed of man. He was the seed of God. And therefore, he wouldn't be born with a sinful nature. And he was born into this world and he lived a life that we were always destined to live. But we couldn't because we were apart from God. So Jesus lived this life that we were destined to live. And then, even though he was perfect, even though he didn't deserve it, he decided, I'm going to lay my life down. I'm going to be the atonement, the, the payment, the sacrifice for the sins of the entire world so that everybody can be close to God. So that everybody can be who God created them to be and they can do what God called them to do. So he did. He laid himself down and he died on a cross and they buried him and three days later, the power of God raised him from the dead and he walked around here on this earth for 40 days. People saw him and there's not just biblical account, there's extra biblical account as well. And then he ascended to heaven and he sits at the right hand of God the Father and he intercedes for us. He intercedes for you right now in this moment. And if you're far from God, the Holy Spirit is drawing you now. He's saying, come home, come close, come be my child. The scriptures tell us that all we need to do is believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead and declare him as the Lord of our life. Just saying, God, you're in charge. You're in charge. So if that's what you... If you're today and you want to make that decision, say, God, you're in charge. Jesus, I believe that God raised you from the dead, and I want to give my life to you. I want to become a disciple. I want to be like you because this is what, who you've created me to be. I just want you to pray with me now. And I invite everybody to pray with me just as an affirmation of your faith. This is not like, well, i got to get saved again this week. No, it's not about that. It's just like saying, hey, I'm, com- I'm in agreement with this. And I'm supporting everyone here that's making this decision today. And I'm affirming it in my own life that I'm a believer. This is, some people call this the sinner's prayer, but I, I don't like that. Because after you pray, you're not a sinner anymore. You're a saint. Because God changes your identity. This is the believer's prayer. So just pray with me. Heavenly Father, I bring my life to you. The good, the bad, and the ugly. I give it all to you. I'm tired of doing life my own way. I want to do it your way. I want you to come into my life and make me clean. Take my sin nature from me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus, for being the sacrifice for my sins. Thank you for raising from the dead. You truly are the Son of God. Be in charge of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make a difference with my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's celebrate with everybody who prayed that today. It's the best decision you could ever make in your entire life. Would you stand with me? Every single week, as Jamie mentioned earlier, we have our prayer team here. They're lined up on this wall. If there's any issues that you have in your life, we want to pray with you. We want to stand in agreement in prayer with you according to God's word for your situation in your life. If you need healing in your body, if you need healing, emotional healing in your marriage, if you need reconciliation, Lord, I just pray that there will be faith 
for miracles here today. Faith for miracles. If you need, if you need help financially, you say, God, I need your wisdom on how to deal with my finances. Listen, let us pray with you. The Bible says that if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask. And God gives it to us in abundance. So whatever the issue is in your life today, we want to pray with you. So you can do that here right after the service. And we ask that everyone else here in the room, if, if uh, you're, you're not staying in here to pray as you are dismissed, just to, to do it respectfully and reverently, understanding that some people are still in ministry time. And just if you've got loud conversations, just save those for the hallway. Save those out there for the lobby. And uh, again, birthday week is next week, and it's going to be good. It's going to be good. You do not want to miss it. Make plans to be here. Rearrange your schedule if you have to. Get here. Bring somebody with you. And make plans to stay afterwards at the Grove. After we're done here, we're going to go to the Grove. We're going to have more party and food. You bring your favorite side dish and dessert. The church will provide the meat, the drinks, and table service. We're going to have all kinds of good things, fun things. For the entire family. You don't want to miss it. I've, I've got a, a prayer for all of us to pray together here this morning as we close our time together. So let, let's see this here. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want your love to be our focal point. Help us love difficult people the way you love them. Remind us to pray for those who seem like they are against us. And may people see that we are your children by the way we love each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.